This channel is only possible thanks to direct contributions from viewers like Kronos, Karazin Magi, Argus, Milk, Bleed Red, Aria Reed, Christopher Welch, Jacob Sandoval, and you. If you'd like to contribute to making more videos like this possible, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month on Patreon or by buying a t-shirt at the merch store. Thanks a bunch, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey gamers, Taz here, and today we're going to talk about that absolute favorite of all Homestuck subjects, Dave Strider and Dave Cat. That means we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's dive right in. In part one, we established what kind of person Dave is and what kind of life he's led up until the point he enters the story and his session of Spurb. A pretty affectionate and well-meaning kid who grows up with an older brother that both hurts and neglects him, all while suffocating his ability to express himself by making it very clear that if Dave wants any kind of affection or even just respect from him, then there's a very demanding and very specific set of rules as to what it means to be a man and what it means to be cool that Dave is expected to live up to in order to earn those things. Because Dave genuinely loves and admires his brother on some level, he internalizes basically all of this early on and presents it as totally awesome to his friends, who as a result, don't take his situation very seriously. Rose seems to understand that Dave's feelings are deeper than they appear in an academic sense, but it's kind of an intellectual exercise to her, more an interesting case study in psychology than an actual terrible situation that a friend of hers is going through. And John and Jade pretty much just take Dave's insistence that he thinks his bro is cool and awesome at face value, and both have their separate issues that make it kind of difficult for Dave to really engage with them emotionally on the matter. Despite the emotional distance, Dave's three friends are basically what allows Dave to survive mentally for the entire time that he's living in Bro's apartment, and he hides a deep well of love for all three of them, nursing crushes on both John and Jade even before he enters the game, his crush on John being just one of the things that leads to the ongoing crisis of self-hatred that we see him fall into over the course of his session. At the root of that self-loathing, of course, is his conviction that he has fundamentally failed to be a man in the manner dictated by his brother, and his increasing sense of confusion over whether that's even really a thing he wants to be. Bro is literally raising Dave to be a hero. Specifically, he's training him to be the hero of Homestuck, who the Alpha Timeline has decreed will be the one to kill Lord English, a role that he's supposed to play specifically because Lord English wants him to do it for two reasons. One is that Caliborn fixates on Dave as his favorite human besides Dirk. And I would say more importantly, the second reason is Dirk's long-standing suicidal ideation, his conception of himself as an evil and destructive force on the lives of everyone around him. And because he values masculinity and heroism so highly, because he sees himself as such a monster, and because he idolizes Dave so much as a figure of moral integrity, his desire to have Dave be the one to kill him, both because it would be narratively satisfying and Dirk is very prone to seeing himself as a character in a story already, or at least trying to live that way, and because being condemned to death by his closest family member, his symbolic father, son, and brother all in one, would be the final vindication of Dirk's view about himself and his own self-hatred. It would be at once Dave living up to the model of heroism that Bro tried to train him for, and proving that Bro himself is the irredeemable monster that he believes himself to be. And since the autoresponder soul is in Lil' Cal, I would argue that Lil' Cal was probably encouraging this mindset in Bro all along, and was more than likely also subconsciously feeding all of this context and emotional pressure onto Dave in his sleep. So by the standards of a teen growing up in modern America, Dave has had heroism very violently thrust upon him, which is visualized when he's confronted with swords from some of the most famous heroes in the Final Fantasy series. At one point, he holds on to Cloud Strife's iconic Buster Sword before dismissing it as garbage, and the Incredible Sword is basically a visual parody of the Kettlebulg, the ultimate weapon of Tidus from Final Fantasy X, whose story revolves around, and spoilers for like a decades-old game, I guess, dealing with his difficult relationship with his father, who he eventually has to kill because he's become a monster literally named Sin. The parallels couldn't be more on the nose if we tried. But if we want to really get in touch with the kind of expectations that Dave is struggling with, I think the best example we can use is, bafflingly, one that Homestuck doesn't reference at all. I am, of course, talking about that classic entry into the great halls of literature, the Devil May Cry franchise. 
Well, the good ones anyway. Which all to some extent revolve around the conflict between a pair of two white-haired brothers. Our wisecracking, hyper-chill, broadsword-wielding protagonist Dante, dressed in red just like Dave, and his estranged, hyper-serious, no-nonsense, katana-wielding brother Virgil, who doesn't dress in orange and doesn't wear shades but otherwise looks and acts pretty much exactly like a 10-year-old Dirk Strider's self-insert villain character. The surface level similarities between Dante and Virgil and the Striders, along with the way that Devil May Cry's characters both take and dish out incredibly intense levels of violence while basically always either laughing or shrugging it off, makes the series a really good depiction of like, the ideal that Bro seems to aspire to live out, and that Dave seems to fear so much. There are two major components of this image of masculinity, and it's worth breaking them apart to see what they consist of. The first is the idea of the capital H hero. Heroism is defined by three major traits here. One is the willingness and ability to evaluate the world and deconstruct it using logic and reason. Basically, it's your ability to face and stay grounded in your reality like an adult, instead of retreating to delusion or escapist fantasy like a kid would. Second is the willingness to expense great effort and, if necessary, even use force and violence to try and correct whatever flaws your logic led you to identify in reality. And number three is to resist the temptation to allow yourself to be controlled by the desire for pleasure or happiness or by the fear of pain. You have to be willing to commit to your cause. You have to be willing to sacrifice for it. What this idea of heroism doesn't include is an innate sense of moral righteousness. We're talking about a very Greco-Roman conception of heroism, where a hero is simply someone that achieves great things by overcoming overwhelming odds. It is not simply a good person who does the right thing, according to however you want to define that. In Greek myth, Hercules is a hero for having performed his 12 labors, even though he undertook those labors as penance because he murdered his wife and kids. By this definition, the most heroic character in Homestuck is objectively Caliborn, because he exists to criticize this philosophy by taking it to its ultimate logical extreme. Caliborn is ruthlessly committed to his cause, has no doubts whatsoever about whether or not he's right or wrong, and is perfectly willing to hurt both himself and others and endure extreme amounts of boredom, pain, and suffering to achieve his objectives. Gamzee and Aridin are two other examples of how this idea of heroism can take some seriously dark turns. Dirk and Vriska are defined by their need to live up to this idea of heroism as a way to justify their own existences and redeem themselves, and Karkat and Terezi, in their own ways, are both trying to live out their own heroic fantasies, in ways that intersect with Dave's arc and make them compelling foils to him. You'll notice, by the way, that this definition of heroism doesn't inherently exclude girls, despite the fact that Dave is raised to believe that this version of heroism is inherently tied with being a man. Here again we see the influence of Lil Cal, tainting Bro and Dave's psychology with the subconscious whisperings of Caliborn, because one of the flaws in reality that Caliborn is trying to correct through his own heroic crusade is literally the idea that women can be important or worthwhile or heroic in their own right, or that they can be anything really besides just accessories and objects to be used by the men around them. Caliborn is basically just misogyny incarnate, and not even really because of women themselves, but just because they remind him of his sister. And based on that association, he decided to draw wild and childish conclusions about an entire group of people that he just never let go of for strange millennia and millennia. And not only does he continue to spread, his hatred and dismissal of women through Lil Cal, but since as Lord English he basically orchestrated the birth and death of both Earths, he's implied to be responsible for, or at least the metaphysical origin of, the misogynistic and patriarchal traditions of humanity itself. Trolls maybe got off a little lighter in this regard, but it's implied they have their own problems with gender equality too. And on top of that, they inherit a lot more of Lord English's ideology of violence for the sake of violence and embracing cruelty and malice. This brings us to an interesting point about knights, by which I mean Dave and Karkat as well as Terezi, who in imitating Red Glare is a pretty heavy knight roleplayer for a while. Which is that knights, more than any other class, seem to have a tendency to end up accidentally championing Lord English's various causes basically serving his agenda without really being aware they're doing it. Now, to some extent, that describes basically everyone in the story because the nature of Lord English's antagonism is to rig the game from the start and force the story to go the way that it goes, in a terrible, self-fulfilling loop. I mean that they specifically make it, like, part of their identity to be really proud about championing one specific idea that happens to coincide with something that Caliborn believes. 
And not in a Gamzee way, because Gamzee just kind of learns about Lil Cal and Lord English and becomes a cultist specifically devoted to them consciously. This is more like the knights just pick up little bits and pieces of his ideology from the wider culture around them that he indirectly produced, and make it part of their identity to fight for those ideas at pretty much every opportunity. For Karkat, it's troll ideals of violence, bloodthirstiness, and cruelty that, as we just established, are inherited directly from Lord English and Caliborn. Of course, when it comes down to it, Karkat's maybe even more squeamish about getting hurt and hurting anyone than Dave is, so he's pretty much all talk, but that's still a lot of talking. And for a couple of hours there, his vitriol at John and Jade especially is motivated by a frustration and disdain for the fact that their lives were so relatively easy compared to his. As if he really does believe somewhere in the center of him that life should be cruel and miserable and vicious. But he doesn't really want that, of course, and the fact that he's such an impotent weenie about it when it really comes down to it, I think, is actually one of the things that makes it possible for Dave and Karkat to start really emotionally connecting. They were both raised to be willing and comfortable with using violence, but neither of them really is, and that gives both of them a shared context through which to understand each other. Terezi's big thing is justice, obviously, but that's really just a convenient veneer she uses to cover up the same obsession with violence and cruelty that Karkat's so loud about. Unlike Karkat, Terezi actually has the spine to do some messed up stuff, and has to live with the consequences and how it makes her feel about herself. So she commits to the identity of Red Glare and the idea of justice justice as a way to justify murdering, and more importantly, convince herself that she feels comfortable and justified in it. I think that's the primary reason why things just couldn't have really worked out between Dave and her. Even at the best of times, she really just treated Dave's psychological trauma with the same kind of morbid intellectual curiosity that Rose does, affording some understanding on an intellectual level, but no real empathy. And then of course she killed him, and then after that she started talking to him about the morality of killing Vriska, and like, the closest frame of reference that Dave could possibly have to try to understand her situation is basically assessing the question of whether or not bro really did wrong him in the way that he raised him, and whether he's right to be pissed off, and if so, if he's right to be pissed off enough to want to kill bro. And while I definitely think Dave has a lot of bottled up fury for the guy, I don't really believe that I ever got the impression that Dave wanted him to die, and certainly wouldn't have wanted to kill him. So while they get on really well and have a lot of laughs together, their personal and cultural differences just don't make a good match. Which brings us to Dave's own crusade, which is basically the glorification of the specifically heterosexual cool guy. Which finally brings us to the second element of masculinity that Dave grows up with. We already talked about man as hero, now let's talk about man as cool guy. The cool guy archetype is like the peacetime version of the hero archetype. A pop culture, party time, mirror image. If the hero is a man of action, willing to do what they deem necessary no matter the consequences to themselves or others, then the cool guy is a man of hedonism, willing to indulge whatever he wants no matter the consequences to himself or others. What the two have in common is that they're not supposed to care about anything. The hero is supposed to just take it on the shin and keep going no matter what he suffers through or what he loses along the way. And the cool guy is a creature of modern society, where things are mostly chill all the time and things just don't get all that high stakes and dangerous, so he has even less reason to complain, and thus even more of an expectation to be cool with whatever. Unless, of course, some clueless sucker tries to disrespect, at which point the cool guy is still perfectly capable of putting him in his place, whether through his rapier wit or just good old physical violence. There's also the expectation that the cool guy is a sexually competent playboy, a suave and dominant alpha male that the ladies can't help but fly to, though he probably wouldn't call them that. Dave does a lot of posturing to the effect of being this kind of guy to the trolls and John in particular, and it is, of course, undercut by the fact that he's really a sentimental, sappy sad sack who's really insecure about being bisexual. But it's definitely unfair to say that's all he does. That said, I'm afraid it looks like we're out of time for this one. I wanted to get more into the Dave Cat stuff, but there was just too much to say about manhood, I guess. Join me next time, and hopefully we can talk about Hephaestus, Abraxas, Yaldabaoth, and Caliborn's Dave Cat shipping. Hope you enjoyed, and until then, keep rising. Huge thanks go out to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to help support the channel and come join us at our awesome and growing Discord community, feel free to join us for as little as a dollar a month. You can also find me on the r Swap Reddit and Discord. That's all for now, so thank you again, and as always, keep rising.